We're good. All right, folks, welcome back. Uh, the next talk is my one. And today I'm going to be talking about movement-based estimation and visualization of animal space use in more than two dimensions. So if you're tracking animals that wander around flat plains, you might want to go over to the next talk. This is uh, sort of a methodology-focused uh, talk, but I'll be illustrating the method and giving some examples of its utility using case studies from actual uh, telemetry tracking research conducted on some uh, example representative species. So I've, as we've all heard over the last uh, couple of days, we're in the middle of a biotelemetry revolution and I think nothing illustrates this further than the fact that there's a crowded marketplace now of vendors all competing for your dollars to track animals because we're getting increasingly smaller biotelemetry devices that acquire larger and more accurate and detailed location data sets over longer deployments for a wider range of species. And in fact, it's fair to say that spatial ecology is now entering the era of big data. And as cliched as that term is, I think it's also fair to say that spatial modeling methods haven't really kept pace with the quality and the sheer quantity of biotelemetry tracking data. So what we really need are synergistic advances in biotelemetry tracking technologies and spatial modeling techniques to enhance our understanding of animal spatial behaviors, habitat and resource use, dispersal and population dynamics, right? So we all know that. So it's probably good Roger Powell's in the other room, but I know the whole concept of an animal's home range is a controversial one, but I think we can all sort of conservatively say that Animals typically restrict their movements to a fairly well-defined area instead of wandering randomly, and that's a sort of general definition of a home range, right? And so typically what folks such as ourselves have done historically is use a home range estimator to summarize our location data, and these have been developed over the years to accommodate the increasing size, accuracy, and deployment lengths of animal tracking data sets. So you know, decades ago, we had the simple minimum convex polygon, and now Probably 90% of users out there still use, you know, the kernel home range. And now there's some more sophisticated, interesting methods coming online, such as the localized convex hull method, the T-loco method that uh, Wayne Gitz and his lab are developing. However, and this is kind of odd, all of our current home range estimators still constrain models of animal space used to a biologically unrealistic two-dimensional flatland. And this is weird because, as we all know, you can characterize animal space use within the two dimensions, the X and Y of the planar surface, as well as a third Z dimension, which represents altitude for flying species, elevation for terrestrial animals, or depth for animals that you know, swim through oceans or lakes, that kind of thing. And most biotelemetry tracking devices record three-dimensional geospatial location data that comprise those X, Y, and Z coordinates for each location. So here's just a, a download of some of our Golden Eagle tracking data. And, you know, we get the X and Y of the latitude and longitude, but we also get the altitude. And the altitude is really increasing in accuracy with newer models of telemetry devices. The cellular tracking technology boys out there with their stand told me they get an average of like one to five meter accuracy, vertical accuracy now. And, you know, it's funny that we don't analyze that vertical component because we're also mapping animal habitats in three dimensions now, which is really, really cool. So some of these remote sensing technologies, particularly stuff like LIDAR, give us these 3D representations of animal habitats across the entire landscapes that these animals are inhabiting. Yet, the Z dimension is either examined typically separately or ignored altogether. And this is because we've been constrained by a lack of suitable candidate models coupled with the technical difficulties of fitting such models to the data. But if we disregard that vertical Z dimension, it really limits our understanding of the vertical component of animal ranging, interactions between animal spatial behaviors and environmental heterogeneity, and the space use of animals that occupy uh, habitats with a really strong vertical component. So what do we need? Well, essentially, we need enhanced analytical ability to capitalize on the 3D profiles of modern spatial ecology data sets. And, you know, a lot of guys are doing some fantastic work with, you know, three-dimensional analyses of animal trajectories and movement paths, but we also need a broadly utilitarian home range estimator 
that can successfully unite those X, Y, and Z dimensions of animal space use. And I'm not alone in thinking this, sort of halfway through uh, when I was addressing this challenge, uh, Belantet Al published this letter in Frontiers in Ecology and Environment, stating that multidimensional space use is the final frontier in, in animal you know, ecology, and bemoaning the fact that we don't have three-dimensional home range estimators. So, traditional 2D home range estimators typically use a utilization distribution to describe the probability of an animal location at any randomly selected point in time, right? And traditionally, we use location-based kernel density estimators, or LKDEs, which use a weighted sum of kernels placed over observed animal locations based on independent samples from the animal's UD. So that's all these things like you know, traditional kernel analysis. But there's a number of drawbacks with traditional location-based kernel density estimators. First one of which I'm sure you're aware of, which smoothing parameter do you use? There's a bunch that you can choose from, and this makes cross-study comparisons potentially diff difficult. LKDEs can exclude areas that have been used by animals with large data sets, or these type 1 errors, or they can include areas that have not been used due to oversmoothing with small data sets, these type 2 errors. Plus, there's also the dreaded factor of uh, independence when you've got short time intervals between locations. So there have been some really encouraging uh, advances in 2D home range estimation. Uh, amongst these are the uh, Brownian bridge approaches, which are great because they provide an alternative movement-based kernel density estimator, or MKDE. And MKDEs are great because they integrate the kernels over time along an interpolated movement path over the location data rather than using the actual points. And they've got a number of advantages. Because they incorporate time, they more realistically represent animal space use and movement patterns, and they don't require independent samples from the UD, and they can handle really large location data sets. And uh, guys like John Horn and Simon Benamou, and also Bart, is Bart here, are really leading the charge in um, uh, these sort of movement-based kernel density estimators, if you want more info on that. However, they're still two-dimensional. So to address this challenge, I teamed up with Jeff Tracy from USGS and Jun Zhu from the University of Wisconsin, and we created a package for R called MKDE, which should be loaded up to CRAN hopefully this week. We're just doing some final extra functionality on it. And uh, I also teamed up with the San Diego Supercomputer Center through a grant uh, through the XSEED program um, to help me crunch all of this data, because initially it was really, really computationally demanding. It would take weeks just to generate one home range for one month's worth of data. But with the help of these guys, these guys also tweaked the code and the algorithms, and we got a thousand times speed up. So we're really, really happy with the results. And to develop the 3D MKDE, I used uh, representative data from three different animals tracking data sets that occupy three different spatial domains. So an avian 3D home range uh, from Condor data for an animal that occupies steep terrain in the terrestrial environment, used panda GPS data. And then for an aquatic uh, MKDE, I used data from a dugong. So for the geeks out here, this is how we computed it. We used um, code written in R and C++ with a bunch of other um, R packages. The outputs are written in CSV as well as um, ASCII and VTK files for visualization. Um, and it's all visualized using uh, Paraview, which is a really fantastic uh, free to download visualization package. So the first step in developing and implementing a 3D MKD, I'm just going to sort of summarize everything. I'm going to keep the, the equations off the pages here. You can approach me afterwards if you want to know them. But first of all, you construct your MKDE from your observed three-dimensional location data, right? Your GPS location data. Plus, you enter the plus or minus accuracy values into the range calculations. Now, you can do this using the manufacturer suggested uh, accuracy values, or you can do it off a study like this one, or even better, go and test the units yourself and, and get the, the values. So here's our uh, XYZ location data. Second step is the expected location at each unobserved time is determined by linear interpolation between the observed locations, just like a traditional 2D uh, Brownian bridge estimator. But then the 3D MKDE is constructed by integrating a trivariate normal distribution over time along the interpolative movement path, possibly constrained above or below in the Z dimension. Now, this is interesting because we actually enable you to put in bounding layers. So for example, this is a bounding layer profile for a bird's uh, MKDE. And these 
uh, gray voxels uh, represent a bounding layer which um, is not entered into the computation. So this is the Earth's surface that the bird obviously doesn't fly through. This could be a bounding layer as bathymetry for an aquatic animal that's being tracked, and then this would be another bounding layer representing the water surface that the animal also doesn't go beyond. Um, and just quickly, you know, uh, Silverman, one of the godfathers of kernel density estimators, um, pointed out that if you apply a density estimator to a bounded region, it tends to produce an underestimate near the boundaries, so we use a, a reflection method to uh, cope with that bias. So at the fourth step, the variance of the kernel increases as it moves further from the times of the observed locations, right? And then this is just a simple overview of the process. So you input your XYZ location data into the R package, as well as your ASCII bounding layers, and then it puts out outputs for visualization and paraview. Also, Visit is another really good free visualization software that can handle this. And then you can also do all your modeling in GRASS GIS. So everything is free to download. Um, open source software. And here are some of the results, and it actually looks pretty cool. So here's like the location data for an, an avian uh, animal uh, over the DEM boundary, and then this is the inner core home range probability contours, and then the outer ones, and then right up into the 99% outer uh, volumetric contour uh, of this animal's home range. And you can do silly things like this. You could like print it out and then stick it together and create a box, three-dimensional profile of your animal's home range. Now I'm just going to step through a couple of case studies that show how this could be used, um, starting with um, giant pandas that we tracked with our Chinese collaborators in China for the very first time using GPS collars, which was really cool. Now pandas are interesting because they occupy very steep bamboo terrain, right? Now, if you project a traditional UD onto a 2D plane, it can underestimate the area used if the terrain isn't flat. And in fact, as the terrain curvature increases, this becomes more severe. So our estimator corrects for this bias by draping a 2D MKDE over a 2D elevation raster, and then it sums the surface area of each cell of the elevation raster that falls within a desired probability contour of the 2D MKDE. So we use this tessellation technique. It's a modification of Jeff Genesis' um, method. It creates a, a, does a bilinear interpolation in diagonal directions to compute the surface area of each raster cell. And then it uses the cell center coordinates and elevations of the focal cell and its eight neighboring cells to construct eight triangular facets within the focal cell. And then each facet area is calculated and summed to obtain the focal cell surface area. Now this is the cell surface area for the panda's uh, habitat, the mountainous habitat there, showing the cell surface area for each of the cells within its home range. And when we crunched the data, we found that larger surface areas occurred in more uneven terrain and more in the summer range than in the winter range. So when it was winter, uh, these guys would spend their time in the sort of the lower flatter valleys, but then well, when it became summer, they'd head up into the higher ridge lines to feed on different bamboo species. And in fact, we found that Surface areas based on a 2.5D uh, home range showed a 31 to 56% relative increase over traditional 2D MKDE estimates. Going to the next case study is the dugong. These guys are interesting because they occupy intertidal habitats and their very habitat influences their movement patterns twice daily. So I captured a whole lot of these guys and tagged them and uh, GPS tracked them around their habitat off Australia. And what we did with the dugong data is that we created the 99% contour volumes for its 3D MKDE home ranges based on locations when the tidal heights range from a variety of, uh, of bins. So you know, 0 0.5 to 1 meter, 1 to 1 1.5 meters, and so on. And so what this enabled us to do was that based on these 3D MKDEs for each tidal height category um, up here, uh, we could determine the probability the dugong would have been at different water depths and group it into half meter bins. So here's the dugong depth and then the probability. And so essentially, when the tides were low, this guy was spending his time in a variety of different water depths. But when the tides came up high, it moved into shallower intertidal uh, areas to feed on those kinds of seagrass beds up in the intertidal shallows. And the final case study I'm going to go to is the California condor. Um, and these guys are great for this development of this. Um, technique because they've got a major vertical component to their movements, right? They've, they can soar for hundreds of kilometers uh, horizontally and also soar for thousands of meters vertically. 
So what I did is I created monthly contour, condor uh, 3D home ranges for all 30 of the birds that we're tracking for seven years. So that's a lot of uh, location data and a lot of 3D home ranges. What I'm currently doing is I'm, I got a uh, custom 3D climate model validated with field sampling from Regional Earth System Predictability Research Incorporated. Um, and this is a meso microscale scale atmospheric simulation uh, developed by supercomputers. What I'm doing is I got um, all these different uh, climate variables um, that were then interpolated into a regular grid of 3D pixels, which are called voxels, uh, over the, the terrain the condors occupy. So what I'm currently doing now is matching the 3D voxels of the birds' home ranges to the 3D voxels of the climate volume to sort of determine what kind of climate characteristics are modifying the birds' spatial patterns and spatial associations. So here's just some very preliminary stuff. Here's the the outer contour volumes of one bird for the month of November, and then the 3D wind speed and horizontal uh, for that same month. And then you can match the, the mean voxel wind speed against the 3D voxel probabilities, and essentially the sky was spent well, more spatially associated uh, in areas where there was sort of an intermediate wind speed. What you can also do with uh, three-dimensional home ranges is what, uh, we're going to intersect condor pair 3D home ranges to try and identify and predict breeding behavior. So, as the breeding season starts up, we'll collect the GPS location data, create the 3D home ranges, and then put them together and see if they're intersecting to try and get an idea of who's going to be breeding with who. We could also use the temporally explicit nature of the 3D MKDEs to quantify the interaction between two individuals and obtain the probabilities that two animals will interact at the same time within the same 3D voxel. So here's an example. Here's the, the intersecting 3D home range volumes for a breeding pair that we know produced a, a chick, right? So here's the feeding site. The, both the inner core volume home ranges intersected right where we proffer carcasses for the birds, but the other uh, really core intersection of the home ranges occurred where they've got a chick in a nest site in a remote you know, canyon, which we can't often access. So this is a nice way of finding where this stuff is actually occurring. And then, I don't know if you got to see this visualization, but this was created with the, um, the supercomputer center guys. So this is that breeding pair of condors and their 3D volume home ranges generated uh, for the entire uh, series of years that they were tracked, overlaid over the three-dimensional terrain of their habitat. So here are their home ranges uh, intersected in 3D, and then here are the, the home ranges uh, individually, and then also the track movement paths there. So what you can see here is that they've got a heck of a lot of home range intersection in 3D. So that's the awesome thing about this technique is it's such a great visualization tool. With Paraview, you can zoom in and rotate and, and you know, really get an idea of what your animals are doing in 3D. And you can see that, yeah, they've got their sort of their really core areas of home range that they were occupying, but they also made some really cool exploratory long distance moves together as well. So, uh, as a previous talk was pointing out, you know, condors and wind energy have a, a potential for conflict. And, you know, wind energy is uh, causing a high annual mortality of raptors each year in America alone, and they pose a serious risk to recovering condor populations. So, there's really a need for quantitative and technological solutions. So, what we did is we actually brought in the industry specifications for a wind farm into our 3D model and plot them down to the actual site locations where this wind farm is going to occur. So here's our nice you know, slice and dice raptomatic wind farm. And then we created a three-dimensional um, condor home range for an animal that made this long distance move north. And this animal actually flew right through the middle of this proposed wind energy development uh, up here by the border. So the interesting thing is if you plop down a traditional two-dimensional home range over this wind farm, and these are the actual locations of the wind farm, uh, you would say that yes, there's a really high probability that this bird flew through and intersected with this, home, uh, with this wind farm. But if you put down the three-dimensional um, home range contours, you'll see there's a lot less probability because it incorporates the animal's altitude as it was flying through. Um, so 
here are both of those probabilities of uh, collision uh, overlaid on top of each other with the 2D representing sort of a higher probability of collision compared to the 3D approach. Um, and so, you know, this is all very preliminary and we've got a lot of future developments, but, uh, you know, we want to create in the future three-dimensional resource selection functions or resource selection probability functions. We want to be able to host this. We're going to probably host it on the supercomputer center so you'll be able to crunch your data really, really quickly. Um, also in, in talks to put it on the MoveBank um, platform as well. Um, but you could also extend 3D home ranges to a whole variety of other circumstances where you've got a vertical component to animal space use. For example, you could have vertical stratification and resource partitioning in arboreal species such as primates. So if you're tracking a bunch of monkeys in a, in a rainforest, you could create 3D home ranges and see whether they're intersecting or not. So I guess the final take home message from all of this, I'll be the first person to say that no one home range estimator is uniformly superior and that no one fit, uh, size fits all, but we can now exploit the increasing size and resolution of our telemetry data sets in all three X, Y, and Z dimensions and create more realistic and informative uh, visualizations and models of animal space use, which can be then used to inform uh, for uh, conservation for species uh, threatened by impacts that coincide within their home ranges. So I'd like to finally just acknowledge and thank all these uh, supporting organizations. Thank you. Now we had a cancellation for the next talk, um, so we've got a little bit of time, so I can take a couple of questions before the following one. You just said your talk is going to be at the end of tomorrow. Oh, okay, so it's going to be at the end of tomorrow. All right, thanks. Yeah. So I'll take a couple of questions. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. What I often struggle with always is any home range estimation method, whether it's an R or QIS or any other system, you can only do jumps more than 50 individuals to the whole computer cluster. <laughs> right. Uh, and we, on a daily basis, sort of deal with data sets like, I think some of them you saw 300 weeks ago. Right. How can you improve this sort of estimator method to actually accommodate for large variations? Yeah. So, have you thought about and you you have expected that if it is able to handle, say, 100, 200 times the individual, mm -hmm. you've often what you get in R codes as well. Like, okay, they've got two sample individuals uh, included in the data set that's in the sample, and then you run it and it's sort of really confusing. But the problem happens when you don't handle the individual. Right, right. Who hasn't had a computer lock up? when they've been creating their home ranges, right? So, absolutely. And the, the tricky thing is, you know, as the, the analytical techniques and modeling techniques are becoming more and more sophisticated and informative, they're also becoming, you know, more and more computationally demanding to run. I absolutely agree. And, you know, as I said before, you know, we had, it took ages to create a single home range volume just to, you know, and I had a pretty decent computer, desktop computer to run it. Um, but, you know, we managed to really tweak the code and increase the optimization and we got, you know, a thousand times speed up, which we're really happy. And, you know, because it's still computationally demanding, we're going to, you know, it's going to be available as an R package that you can download, hopefully very, very shortly. But we'll also host it on the supercomputer center so you can upload there, you know, to their system and have their incredible resources crunch it for you and spit it out for you. Absolutely. Yep. So if we have uh, uh, servers at our university or something like that, we should be able to run that with your package, the NKU package, from your computer to your yep. servers. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you could run it yourself on your own servers if, if they can handle really, really big data sets. Absolutely. And look, it, it'll handle any kind of XYZ location data. It doesn't have to be animal location data. It can be any kind of XYZ location data. So, so yeah. Right. Um, you just input at the beginning the, the expected plus or minus error variance in the in the into the um, the initial stages of the of the program to develop it. It doesn't it doesn't change according to the characteristics of the habitat or the environment. That could be something worth looking into, actually. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, I'll call it there. Um, so the next talk will resume at the
previously allotted time. So we will start again at 3.40. Thank you very much.